Hello Booktube. I've got a little weekend mail for you here. We're going to try to get this done in less than 40 minutes. <laughs> there are only a few packages. It should be possible for a normal person to get through a few packages in under 40 minutes. <laughs> so let's start. There are no boxes. Let's, let's start off with the first one. Let's see what we have here. My disposal unit is at the ready, <laughs> as usual. You have your mouth full, Frida. It, if you have your mouth full, you can't have more, right? Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, ah, okay. All right. This is uh, uh, this is the advanced copy of a book by an author who needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, I will look at all this extra stuff. Good lord. Here, let's get rid of it all. Uh, this comes out in April. This is Veronica Roth, uh, and this is Chosen Ones. We saw this already. Uh, this is the... I want to say that it's a finished copy, but it says that it's not. It says that it's a review copy. Uh, so this is going to come out uh, in early April. This is lovely. This this edition, I mean, is, is lovely. It's the one I... It's got French flaps and deckled edges. This is the one that I will want to keep. Uh, and if I remember correctly, this has a, a clever setup. Uh, we're all familiar with the Chosen One narrative. That's the, the one that's being baited by the title here. Uh, from Harry Potter to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But Veronica Roth, her, forth, her forthcoming book, brilliantly upends the trope from a unique angle. It's not about a group of young people destined to save the world. It's about what happens after they save the world. What happens to the Chosen One? When there's no more chosen ones, when there's no more need for them, what 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 do they do? Become parking attendants? <laughs> uh, that's a rather neatly handled uh, in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Those of you who are familiar with the Sublime TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it's rather neatly handled in there, which is that the Buffy's status as the chosen one, as a Slayer, uh, into every generation a Slayer is born, is totally upended, uh, and and literally a new world is born. At the at the end of uh, of the very last episode of Buffy, uh, Chosen Ones opens ten years after five ordinary teenagers have saved the world from an impossibly powerful entity wreaking havoc across North America. <laughs> I'm sure I don't need to point out to you what's going on in that sentence. <laughs> Those of you who live, at least I don't have to point out what's going on in that sense to anyone who doesn't live in America, which is the, the neat way that the sense equates the world with North America. <laughs> uh, the rest of the world doesn't do that, <laughs> but uh, uh, Americans definitely do that. Uh, in the subsequent decade after the world went back to normal for everyone but them, because what happens when you've saved the earth from, one, from destruction uh, and become one of the most famous people in the world? Where do you go from there? And this book starts off there. I'm sure there'll be another crisis to deal with. Uh, and this is uh, this is not YA. As far as I know, this is not being billed as YA. I think this is being this is I think this is being billed as uh, I mean, this is the author of, of uh, Divergent. And that divergence is about as YA as you get. <laughs> uh, and I don't think this is being billed that way. I think this is being billed as an adult novel. So we once again have that, that uh, I don't know if we'd call it a concern, but that, that issue running through here is, you know, whether it's billed as, a, as an adult novel or not, is it one? Uh, because YA has certain characteristics, and there's nothing wrong with that, but they aren't the same characteristics as adult fiction. So I, we'll have to see. Uh, I, I confess a dirty confession here that I, I did not hate Divergent or any of its sequels. I, I, I know that I should have, but I didn't, so I'm not sure that I will hate this book. Uh, but anyway, there we go. Let's, let's move on to the, uh, now we've got cardboard, but still no, no boxes. Uh, so the cardboard might be finished copies of things. Uh, yeah, here's, okay, here's a finished copy. Oh, good lord, look at all this material. <laughs> That's all right, I've got a lot of material here that I do not need. Uh, what have we got here? With sans material, what have we got here? Uh, I don't need that either. What on earth? Here, let's, let's just... This is... Uh, this is more translated work. 
uh, a lot had a lot of translated work, even in a little bit of two of 2020 that has already happened. A lot of translated work. This is Monica Zgustova. Zgustova, Z G U S T O V A. Uh, it's dressed for a dance in the snow. Women's voices from the Gulag. Uh, translated by Julie Jones, from what I can only assume is the Russian. An estimated 30 million people died under Joseph Stalin's reign of terror often called the Other Holocaust. In this book, award-winning author Monica Zugostova, Zugostova, Zugostova uh, uh, sketches a groundbreaking and intimate look at this overwhelming epoch in history through the testimony of nine women who managed to survive. While penning the first book dedicated exclusively to the women who lived in the Gulag, the author spent a decade collecting eyewitness accounts from interviews across the world, and here pieces together these oral and intimate histories in the style of Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexievich, allowing the voices of those who suffered to come to the fore. But didn't Svetlana Alexievich do exactly that? If you're going to invoke her name, then doesn't that give us the right to ask? Didn't she do that? Aren't, so, And therefore you aren't the first to do it? Uh, not that it matters. I mean, it's the quality of the execution that matters. Uh, in her interviews, she most of all wanted to understand how the women survived the impossible. What she found was surprising. Within the devastating stories of murder, torture, forced confessions, slave labor, starvation, and betrayal, the worst of humanity on full display, the author also uncovered countless stories of incredible kindness and compassion and of the close friendships formed by the prisoners. Okay, uh, so this comes out in early February. It's going to get reviewed widely, I think. Uh, wow, all right, great. Uh, all right, let's move on. This next one is big, but very light and very thin. Could be a slim volume of poetry. Uh, have we had any slim volumes of poetry this year, have we? I don't don't think we have. Uh, no, no. It's not. What is this? What is this? What is this now? Oh, what's going on here? Almost looks like a Kirkus book. No. Not, not coming to me by way of Kirkus. Okay, well, this is by Deirdre Robinson, and it's Forever and One Day. A very, very pretty, slim paperback from Balboa Press. Uh, this is the moving story about grief, anger, love, and loss. Following the death of her family's beloved matriarch and the separation from her girlfriend, Rebecca, 33-year-old Savannah, her girlfriend Rebecca, 33-year-old Savannah struggles under the weight of her emotions and obligations and longs for an escape both physically and emotionally. Inspired by events in, Mrs. in Ms. Robinson's own life, Forever in One Day questions the meaning of life and what society considers to be normal. Which is more important, appearances to society or inner peace and happiness? Okay. Uh, okay, so this... I have a pub sheet here, but I have no publication date. There's no information on this. Uh, so I don't know. This is, this might be out already. Uh, it's a slim thing. It won't take any time at all to read, that's for sure. Uh, I'll have to check to see when it's out, uh, when it comes out, and whether or not it's out already. I imagine that it is. Uh, so a slim story. Uh, then let's see. Let's see what this next one is. We're getting to the end here, and we're not even at 10 minutes. And that's good. <laughs> That's as it should be, uh, instead of a 40-minute mail haul. It's ridiculous. Uh, someone who can't shut up about books. Uh, so let's see. Let's see what this next one is. Okay, I once again have... Good Lord. Page after page after page of excess stuff that I do not need. Uh, I do not need any of this. Okay, uh, all right. Now we're down to the nub of things. This is from Minotaur Books. Uh... Okay, this is the paperback of, uh, do we have blurbs? That's a few. Uh, this, is, this is the paperback of Joanna Schaffhausen's No Mercy, uh, which comes out any day now. This is the, the paperback release of it. Uh, let's see here. I wonder if we saw this on this channel already in the hardcover. I don't remember this cover. They might have changed the cover. Um, police officer Ellery Hathaway is on involuntary leave from her job because she shot a murderer in cold blood and refuses to apologize for it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay. 
all right, fine. Uh, uh, I'm assuming then that the murderer that she shot in cold blood and refuses to apologize for shooting, she, she's on involuntary leave from her job, so she's been suspended from her job for doing that. I'm assuming that the reason that she's been suspended from her job instead of giving a ticker tape parade is because the murderer was not black. <laughs> if he was black, then <laughs> she wouldn't have to apologize. <laughs> That's, it, it's, it's done for sport in America. So you don't lose your job, you don't lose a week's pay, you stay at your desk. Sometimes you don't even lose your revolver for a week, a day. You just, what? Uh, uh, what's that you say? Oh, Callahan, you, you were out for your morning shift and you've got a dead body on you now? You shot somebody and he was in his backyard on his cell phone? <laughs> uh, well, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to arrest you for murder and put you on trial on death row. We're not going to do that the way we would if you were anyone else, if you had any other job. Uh, and we're not going to fire you <laughs> because you're a cold-blooded murderer and therefore have a screw loose and, and could kill any one of us. And we're not going to suspend you either because, you know, that's kind of harsh. I mean, you can't bring back the dead. <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, forced into group therapy for victims of violent crime, Ellery immediately finds her higher priorities than getting in touch with her feeling. For one, she suspects a fellow group member may have helped to convict the wrong man for a deadly arson incident years ago. For another, Ellery finds herself getting drawn in by a woman who survived a brutal rape. He is still out there, this man with the spider-like ability to climb through bedroom windows, and his victim beseeches Ellery for help in capturing her attacker. Oh, so uh, that, that's kind of a neat gimmick, uh, that she goes to uh, a group therapy session having shot someone and can't stop encountering and ferreting out crimes, even in group therapy. That's kind of interesting. Uh, so this is, this is a paperback release. This comes out in January, in mid-January, just about a day from now. And uh, I'm going to have to see what I did with this. I don't recall it, so I might not have read it. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's see. This, we've got this last one here, and then we'll be done. Uh, let's see what we have here. Oh boy, okay, great. This is the finished copy uh, of something that we saw, I think, already. I think we've seen this already. Lordy, look at all this stuff. This one comes, once again, with a book attached to it, but at least the book has pictures. <laughs> uh, this is by Kent Garrett and Gene Ellsworth, and it is The Last Negroes at Harvard. Subtitle being The Class of 1963 and the 18 Young Men Who Changed Harvard Forever. And this comes out in February. Uh, it tells the story of Harvard University's class of 63 whose black students fought to create their own identities on the cusp between integration and affirmative action. In the fall of 1959, Harvard recruited an unprecedented 18 Negro boys as an early form of affirmative action. For years later, four years later, they would graduate as African Americans. Some 50 years later, one of these trailblazing Harvard grads, Kent Garrett, so he, he this is the author himself, there he is. Uh, one of these trailblazers uh, would begin to reconnect with his classmates in order to explore what their time at Harvard meant. So he realized that he lived through history and that it was, it was incumbent on him to write it. Fantastic. Uh, using his own experience as a television producer and documentary filmmaker, he and his partner Gene Ellsworth interviewed 14 of the 18 graduates who were still alive in order to uncover their unique stories. Wow, okay. And the reason that I'm not objecting quite so much to the gigantic amount of, ex of extra information that w came with this book is because, uh, utterly fascinatingly, it comes as a yearbook of the class of 63. Look at that. <laughs> Incredible. So I'm going to be, that's going to be fun to look at. All extra information about books should come like that. Uh, so there we go. That is a nice, tidy mail haul. Not 40 minutes. Uh, so we have The Last Negroes at Harvard. And the, the title is is uh, is apt because the, the, they went when they went in it was culturally acceptable just the norm to call them not only Negroes but boys when they were men uh, and when by the time they came out the cultural zeitgeist has shifted and they were no longer <laughs> that's fascinating then dressed for dance in the snow about the women of the gulag uh, chosen ones by Veronica Roth getting closer and closer to its release date I think this might be the second copy that we've that we've seen here. Uh, Forever and One Day, a slim uh, autobiographical piece of fiction, and No Mercy, uh, about a 
a cop in therapy who nevertheless finds crimes to solve. Uh, an interesting, uh, varied mail haul. Probably a lot of stuff that might be of interest to you. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up and look at that. We're at 15 minutes. That's the way it should be done. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.